you never know it was the effect of your training or it was just the coincidence of the good day of the preparations right so yeah. when i was winning the european championships uh, twice until now i do not i don't know what was the reason that i have won if, if it was the my best shape i don't know because i never checked yeah i think i finished uh, like a comp competing in taekwondo like in 2013 yeah so it was my like a first or maybe second year of my phd in sport physiology right so i just focused on the science and just i quit and i was really tired of losing the weight all the time yeah it was it the was 57 crazy. kilo section came a bit late for you yeah. so it was really it was really destroying like when i was getting older and older it was much more like mm. worse to keep the weight and to uh you know be really uh balance the life and the science and the job with the training so you know it's like and just, were you you did you ever compete at 57 or was it always 54? yeah yeah i was i was like, most of my career i was competing in 54 then then i switched to 57 like for maybe two three years i don't know yeah yeah, yeah yeah but then i just realized yeah it's no 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 sense and no point to go farther like and you know uh yeah i decided to go to to science and then to university and then just focusing on that but now i'm just you know sometimes i'm i'm going to the gym and, and training for myself so it's not so bad <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um for the sake of everybody that's uh, listening today we'll just uh, give a, a brief introduction this is uh, uh our pleasure today to chat with amit batra who is uh uh on zoom with us now from poland um Amit has a, a PhD in, I think, exercise physiology. Yeah. And uh, a, quite, a, quite a career with the Polish national team in ITF Taekwondo. So, Amit, would you share with us maybe some of the highlights of your competitive career and where, you're, where you were training, and then maybe a little bit about your study, research, and that side of things? Yeah, so I start, I start at Taekwondo in 1999. So, uh, uh, it was like 19, uh, tw 20 years ago, right? so uh yeah i got i got really pretty quick to the national team of juniors and then to seniors so most of my career was around the uh, sparring in uh, up to 54 kilograms and uh then my biggest successes was like i was two times european champion in the sparring in uh, minus 54 and uh, in argentina 2009 i was the second uh in the in the sparring also in the minus 54 so most of my career i was concerning uh, around the sparrings and i i need to i need to say that this was my like uh i like the most right from all of the other uh patterns and uh, uh technique skills and so on so the sparring uh, i was really focusing how to be the best in the sparring and uh during my career, I was uh, taking the master degree in sport physiology in the University School of Physical Education in, in my city. And after a master degree, I stayed in the same department for doing my PhD. So both of my uh, graduation project was around Taekwondo. So I did uh, my projects around the anaerobic uh, performance of the Taekwondo athletes uh, for that time uh, and now i'm i'm the leader of the polish mixed martial art association so this is a pretty new uh, organization and i'm helping them like to st structure the system regards the strength and conditioning and sport physiology sport science to to improve the athletes right so yeah this it gives us it gives us a very nice place to jump on to because you have your own experience as an athlete and as a researcher looking at Taekwondo and you know the, the physical development of athletes with that Taekwondo like thinking in place. And now you have a new uh, a new outlet with uh, with MMA. Uh, so it'll be very interesting to learn what's the same and what's different and what's the uh, same and different in the preparation. Yeah, I must admit that the fact that I was the competitor 
in Taekwondo, it gives me really good uh, like a experience to what I'm doing now, right? Because mm. if you are just scientists who are sitting in the university and writing papers, research, and go to the conference and publish, and you know, you just publish the results, and then you just say, okay, thank you, goodbye, and that's all, right? Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is to make the science much more applicable for coaches and for athletes. So I know that even if I am, let's say, smart, I have PhD and so on, they don't care about that. They care how to transfer the knowledge to the training system. So because of the fact that I was the athlete, when I read the research paper, I know how to transfer this to the combat sport environment, right? So yeah. there is a so each combat sport has own culture. And you know how to move in this culture and how to speak with people, right? If you need the rude language to explain something, right? To, to yeah. say punch harder or, or, you know, like in some bad words and you just, or you need to use some slang, you know, like a, some typical language slang to explain, because these people, they are not well educated uh, in the sports science. You need to explain them right how to do it properly right so if you start to talk with them in the science language they will not uh listen to you because they will be intimidated and they just will stop uh, listening to you right yeah and so the fact that i was the competitor is giving me the credibility right so yeah i think the people think that uh, this is my opinion i think so that if i was the competitor I pretty much know how I'm feeling, what is the purpose of the exercises, and uh, you know, you have the same flow because I was losing the weight, they are losing the weight. So I know some of the culture, and remember that the context, so it's not the important uh, what exercise you will choose and what load and so on, the context, where are you, in what people surrounding you, and how to talk with them to do what you want. So you have on the one side the paper, the science, mm -hmm. but the biggest, um, like uh, the biggest wisdom is how to transfer this to the uh, real world, right? So, so yeah. And that's when, where the world of science struggles, isn't it? How to communicate it to, in, in a way that coaches and athletes can work with it. Yeah, this is the biggest, this is the biggest challenge now. So we have the internet, we have the access to the knowledge, but the gap between the science and between the practical world is much more bigger and deeper, right? So uh, this is the biggest challenge. So the coaches, the practitioners, they don't want to listen to scientists, right? Uh, it's, it's really hard uh, now to explain that this may help you, right? But uh, if you find first athlete, second athlete, and third athlete, who will, and people are really like, I would say naive because when I have the uh, athletes who has the successes, let's say they win the gold medals at the Olympics, let's say, or world in Taekwondo World Championships, yeah, yeah. They people think that oh, he was training with Amit, so he know what to, he 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 knows what to do. Like his training must be effective. It's not true. If you do not monitor what monitored what you what have changed in the body through the whole training process you never know it was the effect of your training or it was just the coincidence of the good day of the preparations right so yeah. when i was winning the european championships uh, twice until now i do not i don't know what was the reason that i have won if, if it was the, my best shape I don't know because I never checked. Does my body was, does my strength level or my cardiorespiratory level was at the highest point when I was winning the world championships or like uh, European championships? If you do not monitor these things like every four, six weeks, you never, you know, you do not know the pattern of your adaptation, right? Where is that? So you can find the athletes which were in the worst shape, but they have won the gold medal, right? So because it's never, complex, it's possible. Yeah, it's possible, right? Because because maybe your opponents were much worse than you in this day, right? Very interesting. Actually, Richie was chatting with Magomed Narudinov. You wouldn't know maybe now, but he's um, uh, he's from Norway uh, or competing with Norway. 
And when he won the world title in Germany, uh, he was uh, sick for, was it the month, full month up until the start of the tournament, Richie? Yeah, so he, he didn't train for a long time because he was he he had um something something with his blood I think, um so he wasn't able to train and things like that. But he said he felt that he actually performed a lot better, and it's interesting because it, it's I know something that I, I've noticed myself as well that if you took a little bit of a break for a week or something, you feel much fresher and you feel like um you kind of you're you you're ready to compete a little bit more. Um, but it's interesting just being able to when when you don't have those metrics, you don't know. You're just guessing, uh, and I think I think it goes a lot to to do with your confidence as well. That it, maybe if you have those metrics, that you can be, be confident. So the metrics are not uh, for saying that uh, if you measure this, you're gonna win. The yeah. metrics mm -hmm. are are the purpose of the collecting the metrics of monitoring the athlete is to say the next year to come back to this metrics and say, did our job, what we have done last year, was good or not, mm -hmm. regardless of the sport success. But if your strength level incre increased, if your cardiorespiratory level increased, in the day, what you were, uh, what you were uh, expecting to, when you were fighting in the final world championships and your strength level was the highest, cardiorespiratory and so on, this was good job done, but maybe in the first fight you had the uh, world champion, right? Yeah. So maybe you were in the very good shape. So you need to come back to your results, to your monitoring data, and see if the process you have taken was a good choice. If you do not have these metrics, you are you are if you are not assessing, you are guessing. Mm. Yeah, it's a nice phrase, and but even as Richie was saying there. Part of it is confidence to know that, okay, the work that I was doing was worthwhile because something changed. And for the, for the coach and athlete and their relationship, knowing that the program that the coach has set is achieving an outcome is also, you know, that, that, that's a really good thing to build between the coach and the athlete because normally it's left, you know, it, it can be left until they go on the floor and there's a result. And then, you know, was your coach not a good coach if you go to the quarterfinal? Or was your coach a very good coach if you got a, a, a lucky route and you end up in the final? It's, yeah, yeah. it's not a good way to measure. I think this is the biggest trend, right? So we have a great uh, taekwondo coaches with the world champions, like, like the, their athletes are world champions, European champions. But this is not... This is not the case, like this is not also the truth that they are the best strength and conditioning coaches, right? Mm -hmm. Because, okay, maybe they know the all faces of the sport, like a technique, patterns, like, like uh, uh, Taekwondo, the history and so on. They are very good uh, a coach for Taekwondo. But in Poland, I don't know how it's in the UK now in the island, but in Poland, if you want to be a coach, you just go to open the gym and you say, I'm the coach without any formal education. So you can go buy on the Amazon, the black belt and the, you know, the, the book, stay mm -hmm. in the gym and say, I'm the coach, right? But if you do not measure so if, but it doesn't mean that you have black belt, but it doesn't mean that you are well of formed, educated in the physiology, anatomy, biology and so on because if it was the case my sports science degree would never exist in the university it would be not needed right mm -hmm. yeah so you cannot uh, assess work uh, of the strength and conditioning coach based on the sports success of the athletes which only it's only one element right it's like a one uh, one uh, like a some step but the what we like to do is like is that uh, the good coaches with the greatest amount of athletes of the gold medals? We think that they have the best. Uh, they have the best, uh, like a way of developing the athletes, right? But if you do not measure what is changing in the body, you, you never know, right? So my friend, who is the coach of the Polish national team of sprinters, he said that he was on the conference in the UK, and there was a guy who has uh, like a top sprinters in the world, like less than 10 seconds per 100. He said that, you know, guys, why I am the better coach than you? I am not the better coach than you, but to me, to the, this, the coach, 
is coming the athletes who are at the beginning has like 10 seconds per 100 meters and I'm making them 9.5. It's making them world champion. But if you have the athletes at the first stage, 11, 12 seconds on 100 meters dash, you just can improve one, two percent. So you never be popular, right? So always talent identification, genes, maturation. You never know how this influences the whole system. You need to measure it. You need to, you need to uh, monitor your process. So let's jump a little bit away from that and uh, talk about then where you think the balance should be with, say, for Taekwondo and then maybe separately for MMA between the time spent training for strength and conditioning and the time spent training in the sport specific. Yeah, no, this, this, this is a good question. Like, um, first of all, what you can do is to, and I think how it should be done, that the strength and conditioning coach, the sports scientist, should work closely with the head coach. So the, who is taking the responsibility? The head coach. He is taking the responsibility for the uh, success or failure, right? So he's the, boss. he's the boss. He's the boss, right? So you need to listen to him. And even I know the coaches who are not well educated, like formally educated in sports science, but they know a lot of things. When I talk to them in my language, they exactly know what I'm trying to do. And they just switching the training means to uh, meet my criteria of the training. Uh, I, I'm coming and, hey, coach, I would like to uh, decrease like um, uh, recovery time here to you know, increase the heart rate. And he exactly know what to do to do this, right? So, so I think that if there is a coach from the particular sport discipline and you have a sport science scientist and they talk to each other, they, 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 they just sit down and develop some training program, this is the best way to do. And the sports scientist cannot sit in the university or in the, in the home in front of the computer and just writing clever sentences because the clever sentences never makes somebody faster and stronger. He must go to the training with the coach, sit and observe, and then he thinks, he thinks how to combine the conditioning work or the strength work in the same session of, uh, in the, same session of the MMA or Taekwondo. Because we can do this, like a strength and conditioning yeah. in, the, in the Taekwondo session. Sometimes you don't have time for that, and then you need to give the, some supplementary session, I don't know, maybe Tuesday, Thursday, strength and conditioning, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, take one, right? You need to balance it. Uh, but sometimes you can do, and you should do, at the particular technical, tactical session. You can do with the sparrings, right? So for example, switching the partners, you can decrease the, um, uh, the rest week, time. Rest yeah. time. You, 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 can, you can give the, some extra techniques or withdraw the extra techniques. But how do you know now how this impact the heart rate, how this impact the metabolism and so on? You need to test it, right? So you, you, you can develop different uh, tactics. For example, I'm working also in football. So what I have done, I went to research and I know what exactly size of the fields make the, uh, what cardiorespiratory uh, response. Small sided games, Increasing heart rate because you need, to all the time, you need to all the time move. Big space, small number of players, recovery. The same in Taekwondo. Give one athlete a uh, dolio chagi and, 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 and punching. Second one must only just, you know, move around. Small side, small ring, small mat. It makes them also tired, right? So you can, you can uh, manipulate with the variables to do conditioning or some strength specific in the system. But first, you need to know uh, what exactly you want to measure and what, what you want to uh, uh, you know, uh, get from the session. Right? So this is, this is really hard. But, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's like uh, possible to do. So... That, that's a lovely uh, kind of joining point then into, uh, you know, for ITF sparring. Uh, what energy systems do you feel needs the, the most attention? And what, uh, what do you feel is the best way to monitor uh, progress when you're, you know, training to develop those energy systems? 
Yeah, so combat sports, like not only Taekwondo, but they, they, they classified as a, like a repeated efforts of low and the high intensity, right? So, so uh, Taekwondo is like much more like mm, we call this uh, velocity dominant sport. So, it, because you can be a strong, you, you can be strong in the uh, high forces or you can be strong as a low forces. So, what I mean is like, a, I'm not sure how we are familiar with the force velocity curve, but sure. yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, it, the Taekwondo, like, like uh, they do not need really struggle with the high forces. Like in MMA, when you have a grappling war, like a judo specific or like a wrestling. So, yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, so in Taekwondo, you have like more, more speed, speed, like a uh speed strength right strength speed speed strength something like that so uh, but taekwondo players are really force deficit so i mean that the biggest uh, area to improve is go and uh, go, go to the gym and heavy heavyweight training do heavyweight training to increase the force capabilities if you increase the force you're gonna increase the power right it, it never slows you down because it's the second law of uh, physics. But you, you need to know when to stop the heavyweight training and go to the power and plyometrics and so on, more explosive dynamic movement. But if you have two athletes and one is weak, second is strong, and both of them start a plyometrics training, ballistic, like a very explosive medicine ball throws, jumps on the box, death jumps and so on, strong an athlete, we need only five weeks to develop power on the high level, and this athlete will need 10 weeks to go into the same level, right? So much more time efficient. Second thing is that the magnitude of the adaptation, the magnitude of power development, it's twice bigger than this one. So if you have big engine first, you can tune the engine much more uh, to the greater extent than the weaker engine, right? So yeah. you have the different engines different muscles but if you have prepared muscle you can tune them to the much more greater levels and and you know uh, be more explosive at it but what i found is that uh, in taekwondo people are not uh, like uh, they not, do not put emphasis on the like uh, strength training like a really heavy strength training so the, i think here is the greatest possibility like a greatest area to improve the 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 athlete because we are very good in the uh, look at the athletes we do not uh, we do not uh, put a lot of on the weight in the weight room but we are very explosive guys yeah yeah when there is but when you will ask do the same like let's say jump uh, jump with the no load on the bar He's very good with jumping and with plyometrics because we are just all the time jumping, kicking, jumping. So it's a lot of There's high a level there. Somewhere. Yeah. So we are doing this because of our training. But what we lack is the high forces. When you put the really uh, heavy weight on the back and ask the athlete to jump, he's not uh, able to uh, overcome the high forces. If you improve the strength of us, it makes him faster. I, I promise you, it makes him faster. And also, it could be a good also idea to make that each sparring, each fight is going to be more economical for him. Because you have also some, um, uh, some endurance aspect of the fight, right? So it's, yeah, so it's also uh, evidenced by the research that if you improve the strength, for example, for marathoner, for a uh, middle distance runner, they, 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 they performance goes up because the muscles are stronger so they do not need so much energy so you are more economical uh, in your uh, you know movements and so on so i think the, the the good proper strength conditioning program will make the athletes better yeah yeah i think we've got a a situation where i think for some athletes they've almost gone full circle to where they put the time and effort into their strength, you know, development. And then sometimes it can be a little addictive because it's almost something new and exciting. And they see that they're getting 
you know, very rapid gains, you know, and then they're putting more time into their strength training than they are into their Taekwondo training. And there's a, uh, there's a return on an investment that isn't as high after a particular point. So for us, I think as coaches finding how much to invest, how strong is strong enough is the, is always the question. Yeah, so this is a good point what you have said. Like, uh, what we are trying to do in sports science is the minimum effective dose, mm. right? So yeah. it's like with the drug. Yeah. You do not take the, all the pills, right, you now because to, to make some uh, treatment. You want the small drug, the, the lowest dose, you know, uh, dose mm. to make the, to, to, to heal you, right? Because you do not want to waste your body for some, uh, artificial substances and so on right so the same is with the exercise what is the minimum dose of exercise to give you the biggest return right so for example let's say for uh to increase the mass to, to increase the muscle mass or like uh, endurance people the, this is one of the mistake one biggest mistake in the combat sports people they, they like to train very hard to muscle failure you do not need to train to muscle failure to increase strength and the muscle mass, right? So, but people, because they think it's like a mental war, right? They, they think that if they train very hard, they're going to be better, but it's not true. There, uh, there is a lot of uh, physiological basic uh, basis that makes you uh, worse at it, but uh, I will tell about this later. Coming back to your questions, I think that for uh, lower body, like minimum level of strength is like 1.7 body mass. So for a squat, for a squat, yeah, not back squat. For upper body is like 1.5. So let's say if 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 you do not squat 1.7 uh, body mass on the back squat, don't go for plyometrics. Improve your strength level, and you're gonna be the same explosive as the guy who are not so strong, but he started the plyometrics. So you know what I mean? So first just build the base, build the muscle, right? More stronger muscle, then tune to the more explosive way by the central nervous system and by the relaxed contraction, uh, the relaxed, the, the relaxed contra contraction uh, pattern. Yeah. but. Coming back to the muscle failure and the CrossFit type uh, of uh, training, this makes athlete. If let's say you train Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Taekwondo. So if you go just for one day for like a CrossFit type training, like muscle failure all the time, you're gonna recover for so long time that your quality of Taekwondo specific training, which is most important, not strength and conditioning. Taekwondo is the most important, the combat sport, your, your discipline, right? Your discipline. You're going to be disaster. You're going to be just, you know, laying down and you, you cannot fight uh, well. You will be uh, slow and you're going to be tired and tired, right? You, not, you, you don't have to go really, uh, you don't have to make a master very fatigue to get the strength and endurance, right? So what is the point of doing? fifth set, sec, sixth set, and seventh set of the exercise. If the minimum dose was three set, so the rest of the repetitions were just useless, right? You, you just make the muscle uh, more tired and you're gonna be recover longer, but you do not have a return. Yeah, I think yeah. It, that's the difference between specificity and, you know, the, you know, the, the the, the intent of a program like you know if you pick crossfit as an example where it's you know it's it's a general physical conditioning program it's it's aimed for people who are not trying to improve for their sport and i think when like i've been there i've done that that's no problem but i wasn't trying to compete in taekwondo at the same time so yeah. in the same time i don't have I, I never would have had my taekwondo athletes going to train in uh, in crossfit because you have to focus uh, yeah. a little bit you know but the, I, I really like the idea of the, the minimum effective dose. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that, I think that's something that's very, um, uh, it, it's a good concept for coaches to latch onto. You know, if you're adding something to the program, what is the minimum amount of this that is going to be beneficial? Because time is, is critical. Yeah, um, yeah. 
I, I think I think as well. Um, if if you look at things like that, how important would you think that the nutrition uh, plays into this? Because obviously, if people are trying to make weight, um, if if they're training a lot with the taekwondo training, and how much of an impact does it matter if you're if you're in a calorie surplus, if you're maintaining calories and things like that? If if you're actually looking to build strength, because a lot of people would put the time in the gym, but but maybe they wouldn't be hitting the the right levels there. Did that make a big impact? Uh, yeah, for sure. So uh, after I graduate my PhD, I got the um, contract for more than two years. I spent in the it's called the Olymp Olymp Labs, the, the sports supplements company. I was like a sport physiologist there. It's much more lab based experiments. So we were trying to figure out. Uh, what uh, sport uh, like uh, like the supplements which could be very effective or not but um, in combat sport environment we the people are really um, I think eating too much different supplements and they think they be much more relying on placebo effect okay it's good right you can use the placebo effect if it's the positive effect just use it the placebo effect right but Mm, the British Journal of Sport Medicine uh, in 2018 published the uh, International Olympic Committee like a consensus statement about which sport supplements has the uh, positive impact on the performance, right? So you can only count five, five main uh, mm. supplements. And if you open, I don't know, uh, any uh, company uh, of sports supplements, you know, like uh, what is the list of sports supplements they offer to sell? You have like 500 different. So you have the, the science is giving you five different sports supplements, like carbohydrates, protein, vitamin caffeine. D, yeah, caffeine, uh, beta-aline and creatine. And so we have uh, like a six, right? Mm. So, there is not much to do in sports supplements, right? But mm. what I what I believe is like not sports supplements, but the uh, proper like uh, diet, like balanced diet, you know. You, you, so yeah, there is no point like the people asking me about the sports supplements, and I'm asking them back how many, how much calories do you eat now? They do not know. So why we are going for sports supplements if you do not even know how much calories? You have burned on the training and you have eat at the home, right? So come back to the basics. Second thing, uh, the protein. I think the protein is the best supplement what we can uh, get uh, to the body after the training because it's repairing the micro damages. It's, it's, it's speeding up your recovery, right? But first, if you want to consider some sports supplements, Think about the basics. Do you do you do you even uh, meet the basic requirements of your life? Because you can take hundreds of different supplements, but if you do not eat a minimum dose of carbohydrates, you will not punch or kick at the training system. Believe me, the carbohydrates. So it's better to eat the one plate of pasta before go to the training or after the training than the you know uh, all the different supplements right so uh, people are believed that if they take the different group of supplements like you know the grasp of supplements like 10 pills different they come they're gonna be immortal no mm -hmm. just go and eat you know chicken pasta and so on like a, give the protein give the carbohydrates uh, and uh, you know, uh, wash your hands and and do just maybe uh, every three months like a blood test for like a morphological test if you need the iron and so on and just do it right. If you do not, mm. if you do not have any clinical symptoms that the doctor told you, uh, you could be like an anemia or something like that. Do more tests of lacking some mineral or nutrient or so on. Then consider right. Mm -hmm. But if you do not, if it's like um, you're just taking because of taking, because your friend is taking, and because he won the gold medal and he took before the fight, you never know. Yeah. Did this yeah, happen? Absolutely. You know, right? So, and you need. Well, in, in, 
terms of just the, the energy expenditure, do, do you think that you need to have, if we say, an efficient amount of energy to be able to still build that strength, even when people are just maybe at a maintenance level? So you, you speak of people not knowing uh, what their calorie intake and expenditure is. Do you think that's necessary to build muscle and strength? uh yeah like to build muscle i'm i'm not sure i i i remember that there was like really pretty new study about that you do not have to be on the calorie surplus to build the muscle bigger right but i i didn't read this study i i'm just uh, keeping this for the dietitians uh, guys right so uh but what i know is that if you do not give uh you know like a, some minimum dose of the protein like for for our art, it's like 1.5 gram per kilo. Uh, it's really hard to maintain, like to maintain uh, muscle mass or to build the muscle mass. So, uh, but there is no, also no point to go more than two grams yeah. per kilo, right? So, uh, but when you look at the guys in the gym and he's uh, talking to you that he took four grams per kilo of protein and look what my muscles look like, but you never know that he doped for 10 mm. years. You know, like maybe he took the steroids, but you know, the, so this is the truth that people think that these people, like, because he is taking and he has success for big muscles, so this must work. No, because you do not know all the environmental other factors, right? So you, you, mm. you, 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 never, you never. We don't want know. to look like bodybuilders, of course. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, yeah. we don't want. You, you, you want know, to be lean and, and athletic rather rather than. Massive yeah. and big and strong, of course, for take one loss, especially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, yeah, because you need to keep the weight, right? You need to you, you need to uh, mm -hmm. keep your weight division. And uh, but I think that the, the like uh, what you can do is like keeping your weight division for like all season. It's much more uh, healthy than you know. Do not uh, even keep your weight and then just ten kilo go down and and you know it's like it's shorting your career i think mine is like shorting my career because of because nobody because. told me because nobody told me about that how i can maintain uh, body mass what is uh, what are the implications for my health after the career right nobody told me how to train and you know like uh, what we can do extra and it's like uh, uh, i don't know maybe i could until now train no, but uh, uh, but the sport nutrition is important. But uh, you need to first meet the basic uh, requirements mm -hmm. of the most uh, of the most uh, important things. So, how much calories you can take, you intake, and is it not that you are not in the deficit? How much carbs, how much fat, and proteins? And if you fill this criteria, then think about extra things. Yeah, then think about the uh, yeah. next steps what you can improve mm -hmm. for sure yeah yeah and i i guess the the, the next thing that you you think of then is what are the things that you suggest that we should track and what are the things that you suggest that we should be able to have evidence of for our training yeah so um you, you can you can you can uh, do like a monitoring process which is periodically or like ongoing process like from training to training right because you, you can have the phases of the training, which you want to observe that all the variables are go, uh, going down. This is good because if you want to overreach the athlete, if you want to make the, some hard camp and you want to make that, force him to train really hard, you need to observe that the, some variables went down, strength, uh, endurance, and so on. This is the symptom that you have worked really hard. But then you have that this super compensation curve, and uh, and uh, the biggest problem is how to program the training that uh, the, when when is the super compensation to be at the same time when is your competition, right? So mm. you you need to you need to first you need to monitor the the athletes or do some testing sessions how he is coming back from the hard training sessions, right? So let's say you can do every week monday simple jumping test so you, you can download the app is my jump app yeah 
Yeah. Have that one. You... Yeah, it's good. Yeah. And it's validated against sports platforms, which are like cost 10,000 US dollars. So I know that for group, it's time consuming, right? Uh, because everyone you need to record and so on. But if you have maybe three or four guys, the athletes who are, you are focusing on for some main competition, let's invest the time. Maybe you can learn them to use this app. It's, 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 it's not it's easy. Uh, it's easy. And then just report what is the, uh, what is the decrease of the jumping height. So you, you can use the simple, uh, simple measurements to see the fatigue, right? Is it the fatigue? When is the drop down? When is the uh, jumping height went down? You know, it's fatigued, right? So, and then the question, you want him to fatigue, to be the fatigue today, or you don't want to be the fatigue today, right? So you just think what could be the cause of the fatigue and so on. And then you manipulate with your load. So you always need to see what was done week or two weeks before the testing to, to come with the idea, what could be the effect? Uh, what, was, what was the main purpose of today's result, right? So we can do the monitoring from like weekly monitoring. We can do like a periodic, like every two, three months, every month, like after each some block. For example, and with my track and third athlete, we did like we did like every month. And after first block, which was really high volume work, everything went down. So I did not say like when I explained, coach would say, "Hey, we did very bad." I said, "No, this was the purpose of this block to go and to make." fatigue this guy and everything went down because he has done so much so a lot of oh volume God, yeah. work yeah that he's tired now but mm. like you know four months later when we just moved from the high volume to the speed work like a really plyometrics work everything went up right uh regard regards combat sports i think like uh really simple things which you don't look for the things you can't do it, right? Like lab system and so on. Mm -hmm. take, take, take simple things like, for example, Google Doc questionnaires, like wellness, fatigue, uh, motivation to training, how many hours did you sleep, right? So you have some, so the wellness questionnaire, every morning when you look at the, at the athletes, you, you can also see who is today at the good shape or not because the wellness questionnaires sometimes is giving you the same result with what uh, biochemical testing from the blood of some markers of some muscle damage. So if you do some really hard training session, and I found this when we did the uh, sparring sessions on the Friday, Saturday morning, everyone was disaster, right? So yep. you are the coach, you, you will expect this, but if you have this on the paper, for example, if you are a strength and conditioning coach, so you have some proof to convince the coach, right? The, the coach buy-in, athlete buy-in. You, you, you start to uh, uh, talk with them and building the trust also because you know what's happening with them. Uh, so wellness questionnaires, uh, my jump up, uh, you know, like uh, uh, you can do like a, a body weight, uh, body, some checking body mass. This is the great source. So now we have the coronavirus uh, in, in the world, in Europe. So we came back with my uh, football players yesterday. So what we have done, first meeting, we all of the athletes check body weight. So there was like, it was, they didn't expect this, but you can see that every, each of them who, go, who goes like two or three kilos up, I know that they, were, they, they didn't train. Yeah. Believe me, they didn't train. Even if they got my, uh, the, my program and after each training uh, they filled the questionnaire how hard was the training the RPE the rate of per se exertion yeah. right so they were lying totally because if they were training I know that the body mass would be keep stable right because I gave them the program right or or they were eating so much junk food I don't know yeah but RP, RP after the training, really cool, really cool also uh, tool, which is giving you some ideas which training is hard, which is not hard. 
because R RPE, rate of persistent excision, is correlated with uh, inter yes, with and with internal body load, with the lactate mm -hmm. heart rate, and with the how hard was the session. So then, two weeks later, if you want to do light training session, you come back to your report and you see which training session makes RPE around three or four, like it was like not yeah, so was, hard, yeah. right? You, you, you can come back to you and see which drill or which training was not too, not exact, not like a, too hard and which training session was very hard. I believe that each coach knows without the looking to this, which is hard, which is not. But this is good proof, right? Mm. Because sometimes you can do the same like training session, but your athlete is giving you 10, the top score. So then you think, what's going on? They're in you? trouble. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you gave the light training session, he's giving 10, maybe he's losing the weight. Yeah. So the context. So you need to, you need to look for the context, right? I suppose everybody, or it's very common now that people have, you know, something like this, you know, with the, you know, they have access to their heart rate. They have the ability to, you know, in the background without thinking about it, track some things. So it's, you know, for us as coaches, it's how do we link this up uh, and track the, the right people at the right times to give us some information. Yeah. But uh, on, a, a, I suppose, a slightly different note then as well, um, the, you've mentioned alternating with, you know, uh, more intense training sessions. Do you want to talk a little bit about the importance of having lower intensity training sessions uh, on alternate days or that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, so um, th there is a big misconception, like uh, because of the research, like from 1980s, 70s, uh, one popular research is showing that if you combine the low, like like a low intensity cardio session with the strength session, so w w when you combine this training, like in some period of the time, and uh, you run, for example, you run morning and maybe afternoon you are doing strength training session or maybe in the other day but you combine those two different modalities the uh, running or even cycling like the endurance type work inhibits your strength level adaptation so the people think hey don't run when you are building the strength because you will not uh, build the strength or the muscle mass right so it's not true because you need to you need to run and you need to do endurance work even because other way if you start uh, resistance type work you you could not do for taekwondo work because this is also endurance type work mm -hmm. right to go 90 minutes of even it's high intensity like in interval type work it's there is the signaling of molecular pathways like uh, endurance type work uh, but the question is like now it's coming the way of periodization so when to focus on which uh, motor ability right so you can so which motor ability uh, connect together to give the best results in the end of the program in the end of the preparations right so the low uh, the um, and we talk about a different type of endurance work because you can do you can improve your cardiorespiratory system using high intensity interval training, or you can go and just to the park, to the forest, and let's say 60, 90 minutes just slow jogging run, right? Which is better? So there is no direct answer for this because the high volume work of low intensity is making that your small organelles, which we call uh, mitochondria, you increasing the number of mitochondria. They are really important because they just compute your fat and carbohydrates to energy. So you are increasing the number of these small organelles, so you have more energy to use it. However, on the other hand, if you go and you will do training of the high intensity, they call, we call them sprint interval training or high intensity interval training. So there are efforts or really all out sessions with long or short recoveries, right? But they're really hard, really, something like we, we are doing Close the technical taekwondo session, right? Mm -hmm. 
they making we are not increasing the number of the small organelles and mitochondria in the muscles but we are making that this one mitochondria is uh, more efficient yeah more efficient is is the, the the one small is making like it could do one atp one energy molecule now it's doing three molecules right so the, now we have the concept which is very popular of the polarized training so it means that give some time for slow uh, jogging sessions of high volume but give also the days when you have the high intensity uh, really high intensity sessions when you combine these two you have more mitochondria and more efficient mitochondria right so but you need to be clever with this because if you do everything in the same time you will just uh make so much volume of the training that you're gonna be all the time tired right so uh but uh, there is no one ask where which one is better high intensity or low uh, or uh you know low intensity uh, long uh, jogging or cycling right use both of them but uh, just think when to use uh, which one and and in what what period of preparations you are if you are at the beginning of the preparations you can start uh, you can start jogging with you know long sessions let's go let's build the base right when you go when you go in much more closer to competition leave the leave the leave the long sessions because there are high volume you need to decrease the volume but you need to maintain your cardiorespiratory system so go to high intensity interval training because there is less time but you have the high signal right so we are coming to this small dose, but give return. Uh, it also return. it takes a long time to reverse that uh, the creation of those extra mitochondria. It takes a long time before the cells lose the number of mitochondria. Yeah, so it's like two three weeks. So yeah. so so let's say that before before the competition, you have two weeks of the tapering of the period where you're decreasing the volume. You're much more tuning up, so you are going for more explosive, but. Normally, you do not do endurance type work, so no. you, you are building this freshness, right? Yeah, so yeah. don't worry because you're gonna maintain everything you have done for the last three months, you, you will maintain it. So the fatigue goes down, you are maintaining your fitness level, but because the fatigue went down, you feel so better, your preparedness is on the higher level, right? So always your preparedness level in what shape you are at the competition it's the balance between the fatigue and the per and your level and your current level right but but your current level can be here but if your fatigue went here it it it's make it doesn't make sense right because the fatigue is just pulling you back down yeah yeah it's going to back down. so mm. the preparedness level is the balance between the fatigue if you manipulate the fatigue really well and went down before the competition starts you're gonna be in a very good shape. That's why people are saying that sometimes when I'm the anecdotal evidence when I'm hearing that I was in a very good shape week after World Championships, yeah, or two weeks after this uh, block of periodism, a block of program, right? Not just after it, because just after it you are very tired. But if you give two weeks of just recovery and just low volume high intensity work you have much more big uh, you know uh, preparedness level super yep mm. i think uh so, okay there's something that I, I was i was wondering about as well and maybe you're a good person to ask yeah. we've lost you little richie richie yeah. can you hear we lost Richie. We lost Richie. Hopefully he'll be back to us in a second. Sure. Yeah. Well, just while we're waiting for Richie to come back online with his question, is there anything that, uh, you know, just from your experience with Intake Wando that you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Or maybe there's too many things, but you can pick one or two, one thing. Yeah, I think, I think like uh, much more like a, if I if I could come back, so I would uh, invest my money or like I, I know maybe I would ask coach to invest really good dietitian. Yeah. yeah. 
So yeah, yeah you, you need to have a really good dietitian because um, because maybe not because of the seniors, right? Because the, okay, they, they are adult, they can they can pay for their own dietitian. But what I'm worrying the most is the junior athletes which are forced to lose in the weight. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a, that's a very, very scary place. And for girls, for girls, it could be really very bad long-term effects. Like mm. they could even, uh, like later, they could even get pregnant. They could have some problem with the bones. The yeah. all hormones, they, 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 they could be destroyed. So yeah, I, it's really this is really uh something which is uh we need to take care about it yeah so so we need to take care about that from performance standpoint i would say that really good strength and conditioning coach who are maybe not the former so what what i'm what the treat is even if you are the gold medalist of olympics but you are not well educated you cannot be the coach because something what works for you because of your experience yeah. doesn't mean that it's gonna be worked for any other, right? So this is what in the United States uh, they are struggling with. The NFL football coaches, the strength and conditioning coaches, uh, they are the people who were former players, but they are not the people who are who has a PhD or master degree in sports science. So give, let's give the role of the people who are uh, who know what to do, not the former player or former uh, competition like uh, former uh, athlete, right? Because you could be the best athlete, but maybe you are not a good coach or you do not know how to lift the weights, yeah. and so forth, right? They're not uh, they're not linked automatically. Richie, yeah. it looks like we have you back. Mm. Do I speak? Yes, yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I, I was just going to ask was, um, especially in countries like Poland and things like that, you can see that maybe a week before the championships, you can see that they do almost like a mini camp. And just going back to what you were saying there about um, like the, the, the balance between fatigue and being ready like that. I, I think it's interesting that um, some countries choose to do that. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, this is a good question. So when, when I was in the national team, I remember uh, when, when even in that times when the coach Ozimek and Doletsky, they, they, they were, they were the, after my time, they, they went for the girls, national team, women. But yeah. before, before that, they were men's national team. So I remember we were, we were uh, training very, very hard just before the competition, even though. But I remember there was like a, maybe three, four days before the Euro or World, like uh, just totally relaxed. So let's say it, it was good or not. I'm not sure. You know, mm. we can say it was good because the, we have won so many medals. Mm. But, but I don't know if it was a good choice, right? Uh, what, I, what I think is that I know that Poland has the um, camps before the um, main events because of the uh, uh, team patterns, right? Mm. They need to meet and they need to do. Uh, I know that now uh, it's changing and the last uh, week of the, comp of the preparation is not so hard. There are not so many sparrings and so on. But I remember the times that uh, even the last camp just before the main event was really really hard like two, two trainings per day sparrings and so on right so if it's good or not nobody knows because nobody measured anything right yeah you know you, you never know you never know right and and this is the this is the problem right so after so many years you don't know what is working what's what's not working yeah, it's very hard to say because if one country, for example, is very successful like Poland and they have a, uh, you know, two weeks of a camp before they go to the championships and another country is very successful like maybe in Ireland or Russia and they have no camp but they meet, you know, many times. It's very difficult to say what was the, the thing that made them successful. Maybe it has nothing to do with the, the, the camps or the national team training and it has more to do with what they did in their club or with their, you know, with their own coach. You know, without measuring, it's very hard to know. 
yeah exactly yeah i mean this has been fantastic uh very interesting chat and really good to see you um thank you, yeah thank you is there guys. anything you would like to say uh just about where people can find out more about you and the research that you're doing and so on guys thank you very much for having me i'm very honored and uh yeah so uh unfortunately my website is only in polish but i think that maybe uh, i will start writing in english something <laughs> <laughs> so my website is uh, my name and my last name amitbatra.pl uh you can find me also on the twitter it's uh, amitbatra4 the number four sure uh, also i am in the facebook my uh, my uh, Official fan page is Amit Batra Sports Scientist. Uh, you can find some uh, things there. Most of the things are uh, in Polish, but uh, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm going to translate everything. And uh, if you need some support, just let me know. Google Translate works as well. So, you know, we can, mm -hmm. <laughs> if we want to know, we can find a way. Yeah, I, I'm sure about that. <laughs> I'm Very doing good. the same with English. <laughs> I mean, a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. All the best.